Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. I don't think it makes sense to just keep jumping to the hottest chain of the month. You sort of just lose your community every time and I think your brand and sort of your whole message gets really diluted if you just keep jumping around or you just deploy in like a hundred places. Yeah, so I think as a founder, you need to just choose like where you want to be built, who's your sort of core community, which sort of tech you want to align yourself with. I mean, crypto is very tribal, so I think being part of no tribe is worse than being part of one tribe. So yeah, I think we have chosen to be sort of Ethereum aligned. I like Ethereum. I think we have the community from Ethereum since day one. All our TVL is sort of from the Ethereum ecosystem. So yeah, we are sort of like doubling down on the ETH ecosystem. Looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. Welcome to Good Game. Today, we're going to have the founder of Avo and Ribbon on, Julian Ko. Julian's been, I'd say, probably one of the OG builders in the space now. He originally worked at Coinbase in the early days. I would say he's probably one of the first batches of Coinbase employees to leave Coinbase to start a startup in the early days. So I would say the wave of 2020, there's a batch of founders that left. I mean, yeah, there were batches before, but I would before say they all started funds. Fred, yeah, before they all started funds. That's right. You had Scalar Capital. You had Scalar, Polychain. Polychain. Oh, and Nick Tamino at one confirmation. Oh, right. Yeah. So yeah. those were like the early phased. Like I would say they were the 2013 to 2017 cohort. Right. Yep. I think 2017 to 2020, that bear market like pretty much killed Coinbase because 70% of the people quit. Or it was like 50% of people quit. Do you remember that? Or no, they got let go. It was like a like a very large number. It was either that they were let go or they quit because at that point, no one knew if the industry was going to be around any longer, if you remember yeah. that that narrative. Yeah. And then I think the batch after is where crypto solidified. There was some products people were using. And it was much more clear that people from Coinbase can leave and start a startup. And I think internally within Coinbase, they actually made this kind of like a, a mandate where they can work on projects on the side. So yeah, it's really cool to see some startups like this come back around. We've known Julian for a long time, but yeah, I'm really excited about this. So Julian built Ribbon, which was the first structured product DeFi protocol. That was 2020. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, I mean, arguably he's part of that DeFi summer cohort, Ribbon at least was. And then at some point, I think last year, they pivoted into decentralized options. And I just checked the numbers today. They are number one decentralized options protocol by quite a large margin. Number one in terms of trading volume. Uh, that's the metric that really matters for changes. And then a few months later, he also launched a decentralized perp protocol. It's fairly new, so they are not among the top protocols yet, but they're uh, getting there. Also an alliance alumni, alumnus, and he came back a few times to give talks to our founders. He's one of those uh, crypto standard pretty experience. I've seen at least two cycles now. Yeah. He's probably one of the few founders that actually stayed back on Ethereum and doubled down on Ethereum. So he ended up building out Avo via an app rollup and using Celestia as a data availability layer. So the question here is, I'd love to compare and contrast that versus those that are building on, let's say, Solana on a monolithic chain. I feel like Avo is like the first app rollup yeah. in production, right? They are. And the second rollup to use Celestia. The first was Manta, right? Manta? Manta. First one is Manta. Who was also part of our batch, both Ribbon, Avo, and Manta. Mm -hmm. And Caldera, who's also yep. doing app rollups. I want to learn more about if founders were to look at the space. You and I have chatted about this before, but Building on app rollups from the outside perspective sounds very kludgy and very cumbersome. The question is, is it really? And can developers that are building in the EVM space get on board and, and build on an app rollup and a data availability layer easily? And what are the cost savings? What are the design choices against Solana? And um, are they both comparable? Yeah. Because I think the narrative has been skewed mostly on Solana. Rightfully so, because great products, great teams, and all of that. Well, I think that's because the ETH maxes all went to Farcaster. <laughs> ah. 
<laughs> so the narrative has been invisible for crypto Twitter, but probably still very vibrant, but that's happening on Forecaster. Yeah. Did you see the Franklin Templeton tweets about Solana and Ethereum? <laughs> what did it say? They just tweeted a bunch of like, just both posted about Solana in one tweet and then Ethereum in another tweet. But the Solana one ratioed the, the Ethereum one. So that's one data point. And then last week, Hayden, founder of oh, yeah. Uniswap, tweeted about who's the best chain, which included Taco Bell, Ethereum, and Solana. And again, a Solana ratioed Ethereum, which is really surprising given, in theory, how many ETH holders there are in the entire world. So recently, Chris Dixon went on a book tour for his new book. Yeah. He was on Andrew Sorkin's talk show or whatever. He does this bit every 30 minutes or once a day on stuff and money. And he talked about the Bitcoin ETF and how of a positive impact it was. The very next thing he said was like, oh, and the Solana ecosystem. We're talking like primetime CNBC. And, you know, usually the narrative is Bitcoin and then Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, it was Bitcoin and then Solana. Who brought it up? Andrew or Chris? Andrew did. Not even oh. Chris. Andrew did. Chris is not a Solana guy. Andreessen is not a Solana firm. They're, they haven't made any investments in Solana except for Solana itself. There's no way Chris Dixon would bring it up, right? Yeah, they're ETH aligned. They're more ETH aligned than Solana, right? For Andrew to bring it up, of all people, tells me that even retail or even like people that are outside speculators are seeing the Solana narrative. You know who else talked about Solana? Kathy Wood. Yes, yes, she did. She's like, Solana is the next crypto asset to get an ETF after Ethereum. It seems very consensus now. Yeah. So, which is why I think, interestingly enough, today, Standard Bank talked about the ETH ETF launching, potentially in May. So it might be a good time to swing back and see what's going on on Ethereum. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we have Avo on to learn more about the interoperability challenge that founders face. And is it really a challenge or is it, it might be a slower chugging for now, but maybe in the long run, it might be the better move. Yeah, I'm very curious why he stayed on Ethereum versus Solana, knowing that he's actually also bullish Solana. Yeah, he has a big bag of Solana, from what yeah. I heard. And I'm also curious why he picked an Ethereum rollup as the app chain rather than what DYDX did, which is a Cosmos SDK. That's right. Yeah, it seems like there are a few front runners in the derivative space, and they're all kind of going this route, which is either like an app specific product yeah. versus building on a monolithic chain or a layer two. We talked about this a year ago, more than a year ago. That was before Conduit and Caldera even yes. existed, which is like we kind of saw that launching a app rollup would be the end game for all the ETH aligned protocols yep. because there's no other way. There's no other way to do this. Even if you go on a generic layer two, like Arbitrum or Optism, you're still competing for block spaces with everyone else. And so the only thing for you to do once you've reached PMF is to do your own rollup. So this begs the question for Solana. <laughs> yeah. You talk about localized fee market, dimensionality of fees. Sorry, I had to use that word because that's how they describe it. It turns out um, that, you know, I've talked to a bunch of, a lot of founders, and that narrative might be way ahead of where we are right now. Meaning it's, uh, it'll take time to ship? We have a long way to go before this actually gets implemented the right way. And things could break. It's not efficient, from what I hear. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be very interesting to see how what founders will do that are building on Solana once there's like this threshold hit. And, you know, obviously you got to wait for hardware to scale, things like that. You have localized fee market. And then you have now Ethereum starting to come back up with the app rollups, things are working, and we're seeing founders that are building successfully using these types of infrastructure. So yeah, it's just fun to see how this is all going to play out. Cool. Let's uh, have them on. All right. Let's bring on Julian. Julian is a founder, is a builder of crypto derivatives protocols, but he himself is also a trader. We're going to talk about why founders should, should trade. Hopefully use their own product. But I love to talk to Julian about his trading experience. I know he trades perps, options, and meme coins. Meme coins are a big topic these days. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about Julian's founder journey. I remember talking to Julian last bear market when he was still 
at Columbus, or maybe you were doing uh, some. I think at that time you were doing some products for Tezos, I think, and you were also doing some side products. Tezos. Yeah, this is like two cycles ago. <laughs> two cycles ago, yeah. Two cycles ago. And you were doing some liquidation bots. Yes. And you talked to me about Matrix Board, which, by the way, is the company of Jihan Wu, who liquidated the market a month ago. <laughs> His intern liquidated the market a month ago. Matrix Board was the original inspiration for the original version of Ribbon, and then later on, you started building options and imperps. So we can dive into all that journey. I wanna. Learn more about your move to uh, working with Conduit as an app rollup for founders. Like, mm-hmm. what was experiences like? I know you uh, compensate a lot of fees to for the users. Here's to see how that's going. Celestia, I think you just announced a partnership with Celestia. So, what are the cost reductions like? Is it real? And how easy is it for you to move from Celestia to, let's say, protein sharding or other types of layers? And really, how did you uh, get your first few customers when you started Ribbon? I'm curious about that as well. You mentioned on one of your pods that you've built some relationships with users to the point where you could start any product and they'll always be there for you. So I'm curious on how you build those like long-term partnerships there. But obviously, there's a lot to talk about. But the first thing on my mind, and I think on everyone's mind, is the Jupiter airdrop tomorrow. And it's funny, Avo has kind of become the kind of the price discovery platform for all tokens that are about to launch. Dimensions is another one. The list goes on and on. And so maybe with Jupiter, you've mentioned that you've used the product and you trade as a founder. So maybe kind of talk through the Jupiter airdrop. How has it been from a user acquisition perspective? And then maybe talk a bit about trading, etc. Maybe I'll start with like the Genesis idea of why we created. Uh, we were basically the first guys in my DeFi to try this free market stuff. Like FTX tried this back in the day. Like they listed yeah. Coinbase stock before Coinbase IPO. Like that was such a crazy market to trade. They did this like crazy Trump market as well, which was really fun and interesting. So I think, you know, like subconsciously these ideas were already in my head. But yeah, maybe just six months ago, one of the more interesting or hype projects, say, they Binance sort of announced like they were going to list, say, on like their launch pool or something, like next week. And I think within our office, it? yeah, we have... Who was it? Say Protocol. Yeah, you were talking about you were launching it or another exchange? No, no. Binance was going to list it. Binance. Okay. Binance announced, okay, we're going to list, say, next week. And, you know, there are a bunch of, like, traders in our office and we're all just, like, trying to guess, like, oh, do we think it's going to be, you know, over or under a billion FDB? Like, everyone's sort of guessing where the price is going to be. And we just had this idea, like, okay, what if we just made a market for it? And we just, like, launched it on Avo. Like, what if we made this into a perp that people could just trade on Avo? Would that even be feasible? So that was the idea. We basically came up with this, like, sort of combined what FTX did and, and sort of put it in, like, a DEX style format. And it was really interesting. I mean, I think the market was already immediately somewhat efficient. Like, the launch price or where we opened the market ended up being pretty close to where Binance launched it. We just kept doing it again and again. And each time we did it, more users came onto the platform, more people wanted to speculate on these things. So it has somehow naturally become like one of the things Avo is most like known for. Like the Jupiter thing has been basically the biggest one so far by a lot. There are all these YouTube videos about airdrop farming and like Jupiter airdrop and all these guys like teaching Jupiter airdrop recipients on how to hedge their airdrop on Avo. So it's really become like a, a big thing. But yeah, I mean like for Jupiter specifically, it's an amazing product. I think the team there has like spent the last two years grinding it out and the product is like almost perfect, I think. We work on every small like optimization from like how quickly tokens like show up on your feed. They they care about like the little details. So I think it's like a really, really amazing experience. I personally really like the DCA function. Like it's so easy to sort of like I mean on Ethereum. If you want to get in or out of a token that's illiquid, you're not going to sit there and click transactions for like six hours, right? So you, oh, you're just going to say, exactly. You're like, oh, I'm just going to take the 2% slippage or 5% slippage and just like Much do more. it right now. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I think like Jupiter has somewhat unlocked this new type of like trading behavior where if I'm in something really liquid, I know I can like t up every minute for the next 24 hours. And like my price impacts like pretty low each time. So yeah, it's great. I mean, I use it all the time. I think they're going to crush it. 
I do think it's sort of become like the rallying cry across the whole ecosystem. And I mean, they do deserve it. Yeah, where the market's going to actually launch, I think it's going to be very interesting. Currently, the prices are like between 6B to 7B FTV. My guess is it's going to trade around there. But yeah, very interested to see what happens tomorrow as well. Awesome. 6B, isn't that higher than Uniswap or close to Uniswap? I think it's higher. <laughs> That's FTV. Yeah, FTV. So people are trading on the market cap, I think, which is at 1.3 billion circulating. It will be bigger than Uniswap, I think. Like, you know, they have like a million people who are excited about this. So I, I think just the momentum behind it is going to be a very big launch. And if you care about fundamentals, they also do have like revenues and stuff like that from their perps products. So you can justify why it may be actually more valuable than Uniswap. By the way, Julian, did you see Hayden's tweet the other day, which is the best trade? <laughs> and he had oh, yeah, Chip I saw that. Chipotle, <laughs> Chipotle, Solana. Taco Bell. Oh, Taco Bell, yeah, not Chipotle. And Ethereum, Solana. Do you think he's going to Solana? No. I think just like culturally, I think they've built their whole identity around the Ethereum ecosystem. I don't think he'll ever sort of leave the ecosystem. But, you know, I'll be very impressed if he does. I think at this point, he won't. Are you going to Solana? <laughs> uh, we have thought about it. I think I'm like a big fan of Solana. I own a lot of Sol. I use the ecosystem a lot. I think as bullish as you guys on it. But I do think, you know, as a project, like, I don't think it makes sense to just keep jumping to the hottest chain of the month. You sort of just lose your community every time. And I think your brand and sort of your whole message gets really diluted if you just keep jumping around or you just deploy in like a hundred different places. Yeah. So I think as a founder, you need to just choose like where you want to be built, who's your sort of core community, which sort of tech you want to align yourself with. I mean, crypto is very tribal. So I think being part of no tribe is worse than being part of one tribe. So yeah, I think we have chosen to be sort of Ethereum aligned. I'm obviously still, I like Ethereum. I think we have the community from Ethereum since day one. All our TVL is sort of from the Ethereum ecosystem. So yeah, we are sort of like doubling down on the ETH ecosystem. Yeah, you're seeing that with Magic Eden, right? I mean, Magic Eden went from focusing purely on Solana, where they had a very strong community to focusing on other chains and the people on Solana felt neglected. And so then they realigned with Tensor. And then if you look at Magic Eden across the board, they probably have sparse usage across some chains, but heavy usage on Bitcoin. So I think what you're saying is true, which is founders should be focusing on one ecosystem to build. Very few DeFi protocols actually succeeded by going multi-chain. Yeah. The other example I can think of is OpenSea. OpenSea went to Solana last cycle, mm -hmm. didn't do any volume yep. there. The only app, it's not really a protocol, it's an app that I can think of that is succeeding going uh, multi-chain is uh, Phantom. And I think there's a Phantom is doing pretty well on Ethereum, still far behind MetaMask, but they have like 100,000 users. But I think there's a fundamental reason behind that is because people hate managing five different wallets. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. much easier to use one than to use five. I think, yeah, we've just seen like, it's sort of the, oh, I like to think about it as like, if a lot of like projects, they don't know what to build next. They just deploy the same thing on somewhere else. And they <laughs> hope that would like magically bring or fix all the problems. But that's usually worse. And I mean, there are these apps who just list like, oh, we're on 20 different networks, but 99% of them drive zero value. It's just more, yeah. more management, more headache. I think the yeah. only startup that did well in the early days was Aave, where they launched on every EVM chain and they ended up just becoming the de facto liquidity layer for all those chains. But that was just because of like, I think it was just early in luck. I mean, I think, I do think like their market share has also been cannibalized yeah. on different ecosystems like Arbitrum has their own native lending or whatever. So it's not clear to me that there's really no moat. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, if you are lucky enough to be the biggest player on one of the biggest chains, you should just like focus on that. So I think our goal now is just like, we want to be the biggest prep decks on Ethereum. Like that's like a big enough market for now. And then we can focus on different things adjacent, but, uh, we don't want to be the DEX that's on five different chains and like just sucks across the board. So, yeah. Well, you decided to move to uh, Conduit because of that, right? And you were the first customer there? Yep. The first customer to, to launch like a mainnet chain. Yeah, that's pretty, uh, I'm sure a lot of founders would have been scared to do that. 
what did you see so clearly on why you should have, like why Avo should have been an app rollup? What were the design decisions you made as a founder to decide that you're going to go app rollup? Yeah, so this was, you know, over a year ago, I think even like the word OP stack was not a thing. No one mentioned the OP stack as like a stack that people could use. Like even base wasn't even born yet at that point in time. But I think, you know, we felt already that obviously we couldn't build on Ethereum mainnet, like the gas is just too crazy. The next alternatives is like, do we build on another layer one, Solana, maybe something else. But for the reasons I said before, we wanted to stay on Ethereum. So, yeah, I think the next natural sort of progression was like, okay, do we build on Arbitrum or existing layer twos? Or sort of like, can we just build our own layer two? And I think for many reasons, we decided just to choose the latter. Some examples is like, we felt it's really important for an exchange to have like an isolated execution environment. So, for example, you know, we saw this when Arbitrum dropped their token, right? Like the whole chain basically was unusable. The, all the explorers were going down. And I think it's really bad experience for users if some other random app on the chain takes down the whole chain, especially if you're trying to trade. So I think we felt like, can we build this one chain that's sort of focused around trading for now and wouldn't get clogged up by some NFT mint? That was sort of one of the major considerations. We also wanted to change some of the parameters around like the default layer two parameters like optimism and arbitrum have this seven day withdrawal window we we thought you know that didn't really make sense like if you are using Evo as the exchange you're trusting the exchange you know like our order book is sort of off chain you already have a bunch of trust around this application you don't actually need this like crazy seven day like super long like a dispute yeah. period i think we felt like we just shortened off that and improve the UX. I think we felt that if like no exchange in the world charges you a percentage point to withdraw, but if you use a bridge, like if you want to bridge 10 million out of Arbitrum or Optimism, you got to pay some basis points on that transaction, which is like really, really insane for an exchange. Every exchange in the world, you just pay, you know, the 30 cents or the $1 to move 10 bucks. So I think yeah, we just felt like even if we keep the seven day period and use all these bridges, the UX would just be like terrible. So yeah, I think that's some of the reasons why we decided to do our own app roll up. And sort of the decision then became like, do we build it ourselves? Like, do we run all this infrastructure in house? Or could we like work with a different company? And actually, like funny story, there was a different company which we were trying to work with. They're now called Caldera. Maybe you guys are investors. I'm not sure. But yeah, we actually used yeah. them for, okay, cool. We actually used them for like our test net for the first few months while we were building it. And yeah, like one month before mainnet paradigm, basically we we're like chatting with us and we were like, oh, by the way, we're incubating our own version of this. <laughs> and I think at that point we were already pretty locked into Caldera. But after speaking to their team and like, just knowing for sure that I can call like the CTO of paradigm and say, yo, the thing's not working. <laughs> Yeah, that was like pretty pretty good security, and also Extra you shit. know they off. Yeah, we were like the first customers. They offered us pretty yeah. good terms. I felt like their team was like pretty stacked on like a DevOps background, so we felt more confidence in sort of using them as a team. And yeah, I think like we had one sort of opportunity to move before mainnet. I think once we had already done mainnet, we don't want to move anymore. So we just decided, yeah, let's make that switch to, to conduit. Yeah, they've been great so far, so no regrets there. I think today, by the way, I'm familiar with the backstory of why you switch because I was talking to Caldera. Why is their first customer switching to their biggest competitor? And we're like, <laughs> just scratch our head and, and we're like, the only possible reason is Paradigm. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's the only possible reason. To be fair, like, there was no like pressure. I think there was no like sort of, oh, you have to do it as a portfolio company. Obviously, we can make our own choice. I think we just felt like since we were getting sort of like VIP service from them to just make this happen, make this deal work to our favor. I mean, they were also just trying to get off the ground. So I think it worked out for us. I think we got some pretty good terms like on the economics as well. Like I've heard these rollups now have to sort of do some sort of sequencer, ref share and stuff like that. But I think we were pretty firm in having like it being fixed fee only. Like if we were ever to do ref share, I wouldn't want to use it. So that was sort of baked into our deal on day one. So what are the 
not your terms, but like the average terms that founders would have to think about? I actually don't know what the market is at okay. right now, but I've heard like through the grapevine, you know, some of these newer customers are paying some sort of rep share on like the sequencer fee or something. So you pay and, like, per month or something? Yeah. So like the calculus in my head is like, is this cheaper than hiring one full-time DevOps engineer in-house? And it was, yes. And I get like a 24-7 DevOps team who's pretty good with like strict SLAs and so on. So I think like the choice for me is pretty clear. And yeah, they've been good so far. The users of Avo, what token do they use to pay for their transaction fees? So yeah, that was like a key part of our design as well. Like we didn't want users to pay for transaction fees at all. Because I think, you know, if you're trading on an exchange and let's say you want to do a million dollar order, I don't, I don't want you to think about, is it cheaper from a gas perspective if I do like 10, 100K trades or just one big trade? Like, I don't want the number of actually orders that you send in to cost you something from like a mental calculation. I think we just decided we need to make it feel like a centralized exchange. Like I can literally spam as many orders as I want and I don't pay anything for it other than transaction fees, like actual exchange trading fees. So yeah, I think we just decided we're just going to subsidize all gas for users. All transactions that happen on the chain, we pay for it. And yeah, users just don't feel that at all. I think even if it's like tiny, the mental like stress of thinking about like, is this adding up in the background is really bad. So we just made it basically free from like a gas perspective. Do you accrue value right now? Yeah. So... I mean, we have trading fees and that's sort of where we make all the money. The gas of like what we subsidize is just a cost on our... So users yeah. don't pay gas fees, but there is a trading fee that they pay to you. Yep, which um, is sort of like in line with the other exchanges. It's in line with uh, centralized exchanges, right? Yeah. And recently you uh, started using Celestia as your DA layer. Talk to us about that decision. Yeah, so because we subsidized this gas, there were like three major things that changed in like Q4. One of them is our users started going exponential. I think now we have about like 15,000 daily actives and about 30 something thousand weekly actives. So it's a lot of small accounts just like trading, trading, trading. Each time they trade, we pay for the gas and Ethereum started going up in price and the Ethereum chain got more congested. So it's like a triple triple whammy for us in terms of like how much we were spending on gas. Yeah, I think within Q4 itself, it went from like 20k a month to like 200k a month. Yeah, so I think definitely changed like the way we, what we expected in terms of like the economics. So, you know, Celestia was just getting up and going. We spoke to them and I think we just realized that like if we can switch like the DA layer to Celestia, that cost becomes effectively close to zero. And that's another 200k a month in our pocket, which, you know, we can give back to users in different ways. So we thought that was like the best business decision to do at the time. Celestia was just like getting their main net up. So I think we were like, okay, let's try to be like customer number two of Celestia on mainnet. Yeah, we just made it happen like last week. First customer was Manta, right? Yeah. So effectively, when you switch from Ethereum to Celestia for DA, you almost reduce the fees by 100%, close to 100%. Is that what you're saying? Yep. It's like in the 90s. It's like extremely dramatic, like drop in DA fees. And that is like our biggest cost. So I think it made sense from like a business perspective, for sure. From what I've heard, 48, 44 doesn't even come close to that, right? Yeah. So that's what we've heard as well. I mean, I think a lot of people have different benchmarks and numbers and ultimately like it really depends on the actual usage of the protocol. Yeah, I think it's still a market, still like a bidding market for this blob space. So I think we don't actually know like exactly how much cheaper or more expensive it's going to be. But yeah, I mean, I think if it's sort of like dramatically, if it's in line with Celestia, maybe we would shift back to like native Ethereum DA. Why would you do that? Is it just being Ethereum aligned or like, I'm just curious, like, yeah. They're just like less trust assumptions if okay. the DA is on Ethereum as well. Now you're sort of trusting that like the Ethereum to Celestia communication is sort of secure. But I think it's like a fine trust assumption for now. But yeah, we'll see how 4.4 goes. 
What about Eigen? Yeah, I mean, Eigen, we also spoke to. They are, they're great. I think they're going to do very well. The main issue for us was just they were not live. So we couldn't really consider it. We could wait a few months and pay another half a mil or a million bucks in gas, but we didn't really want to do that. Is there any reason for you to use more than one DA layer for, I don't know, data redundancy purpose? Yeah, so when we actually did the Celestia thing, it was sort of a partnership with like Conduit as well. Like they helped us build it. And there's this sort of like fallback system that they have. So if Celestia goes down for any reason, like the sequencer can basically just post like DA back to Ethereum. So there is like a easy baked in switch to just like either posting two chains at once or like fall back if necessary. So we felt like that was like good as well, just in case, you know, Celestia goes down or something. When Eigen on Avo. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> everyone oh, mean, always I, I asks. Uh, the pre-token per pre-launch, oh. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it's made at like 10 BFDB or more. But I think like what I've learned making these markets or launching them is the best time to do it is, you know, maybe a month or two before the actual token launches. I think if you launch... For example, like layer zero is a good example. They've been teasing this token for so long. So no long. one knows, but no one knows when it's going to launch. Like, do I actually want to trade this market if it comes out in two years? Like, I don't think yeah. I care enough to do it. So the sweet spot is when we know token is confirmed. It's going to be on this date. This is the supply. Everyone's like doing the math on like everyone's playing the speculating game on, on where it's going to trade. I think that's a much more interesting market to trade than something which may never launch really yeah so we have just found like the sweet spot is between one week to a month or two so you know when i get announces they're going to do a token we'll be ready to make a market for it so julian you you build a perp exchange decentralized exchange and options decentralized exchange but you are a trader yourself as well which to be honest not every dex founder is Right, but you are a user of your own product, or at least of the ecosystem. So, what do you trade? What do you trade? Do you trade derivatives or meme coins or the majors? And what's your strategy? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't have a strategy. I think generally, I do own a bunch of stuff which are like more of my long term holds. But I think I do I'm very active in like the daily slash weekly narrative rotation game. I think it's fun. Obviously, I think I'm decently good at it. And also, like, what I tell myself is it keeps me sharp on, like, what the market is thinking and talking about. So, yeah, I think a lot of people have actually praised this or, like, spoken about, like, Avo being actually, like, really in tune with what the market wants to trade. And that's really just, like, me knowing what the narrative is right now. I want to trade this coin. I'm just going to list it as well. Yeah, I think, and actually, that's, like, a big part of what we do. Are you just trading perps or meme coins? Also, whatever is hot, I think I've been in all the Solana meme coins. Did you catch GameStop this past weekend? I didn't get into the, the <laughs> stock coins, unfortunately. I was like bag holding Anita Max win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah, went to zero. One, that went to zero. <laughs> and also, like the mock jube. And yeah, mock jube stuff is very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think just seeing the founder in the Discord, like shit posting with everyone else and just like. Telling everyone this coin is going to zero and people just keep buying it. It's like very fun and interesting. So I was participating in that as well. well what's yeah, the I... rotation of the next uh, two weeks? Next two weeks, I don't know, man. Like I think it's been very choppy since like the ETF. I actually had a plan to sell on the ETF day, but uh, I got caught up in the hype as well. Like just seeing the inflows, I thought it was like, it was, it was too big to, yeah, basically I was bull pilled. So I, I did buy a bunch of like calls and stuff, unfortunately. But yeah, I mean, in the <laughs> last sort of... You bought calls on Able? Yeah, I only trade on Able for options these days. But yeah, I think obviously that was wrong. So I, I got wrecked there. But I mean, in the last sort of two weeks, just been trading a bunch of Soul. I'm in a bunch of like Soul Eco coins now as well. Soul's great. I mean, uh, Soul's <laughs> doing great. Whiff is doing... It's holding pretty steady as well. <laughs> what are your uh, long-term bags? Tau. Tau? Oh, uh, my God. I think we're just talking about it. Chow and I. Yeah. I don't think I'm qualified to explain why it's good. 
I just like the coin. <laughs> uh, uh, it's been just going up. Ethereum, Sol, I think those are my three big ones. On like the gaming side, I like Ronin a lot. Been buying and staking since like last year. We're going to have Alex on our app pretty soon to talk about Ronin. What is your thesis on Ronin? I mean, I've just like looked at the numbers of the users and the players and it's just so like, it's just been growing like crazy. So I don't have like a clear tech thesis on why this chain is better than another chain. I don't think it really matters. I think, yeah, like Pixels was one of the big games that launched on Ronin and that's been like really popping off. It feels like the XE 2.0, basically. Same crowd, like uh, run it back. same type of user, which is like, Indonesian slash like Filipino yeah. like airdrop farmers and there's so many of them across like YouTube, TikTok, every like normie platform. So that was sort of my thesis when I bought Ronin last year. Ronin has more than one game now because it used to be just Axie, right? And now you're saying there's an ecosystem of games. Yeah. Pixels is the big one in the last few months. What kind of game is it? It's kind of like a MMORPG, but it looks a bit like pixelated, I guess. <laughs> I don't know too much about the game, unfortunately. That's why I didn't buy the token of the game. I just bought the infrastructure. Yeah. Infrastructure tokens still outperforms the app tokens. Like it's... <laughs> yeah, usually. Yeah. And Sol, right? You have Sol in your long term. I feel like Tao, like so many people are bullish Tao and no one is able to explain the thesis. There's no articles that really explains it deeply enough either, right? I read like articles this morning there's no good explainer of how it works all i know is that's yeah. ai and crypto <laughs> that's it <laughs> like, yeah it's like a, the original thesis was like it's ai <laughs> and crypto it has like a cult following it's really difficult to buy so had to make like a maxi account bought bought like tau got the wallet like withdrew the thing into this random like wallet i've never used before but i mean we were also like the first dex to list like a tau perp so that, that got a bunch of like attention when, when Towers had its first run. But yeah, I mean, Bybit just launched it like today. So now there are multiple venues to trade Tau perks. Awesome. So going back to your journey as a founder, you started with Ribbon and then you made this fundamental shift to Avo. And that was because of the last bear bull market cycle. And, you know, founders are always thinking about pivots, right? I wouldn't consider this a, a major pivot. I think you just added more product lines, but to a certain degree, it's a pivot. How did you think about this pivot? Why did you decide that this was the right move? Or how did you know that this was the right move? Yeah, I mean, I think maybe for some context, like we were working on like the Ribbon product, which was mostly like this whale-centric DeFi yield product for the first year and a half, almost two years. And I think we already saw like the writing on the wall, like when the bear market started coming, especially like the week of the Luna collapse. You know, we just saw like, 30% of our TVL disappear in one day. Why would a bear market hurt a structured product, yield product? So our yield product was sort of denominated in coins, ETH, BTC, primarily. We had a different product, which was selling puts, which basically got wrecked on that one week when everything went down. So yeah, I think that one week, our vaults had a bunch of losses. The vaults that didn't have losses basically were denominated in coins. So those went down a lot as well. And I think immediately there was like a vibe shift of people just want to pull out money from the riskiest yield stuff in DeFi and either move them to the safest stuff in DeFi or just like exit to fiat. I think DeFi was exiting period. Everyone was just scared. I remember at that point. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think like that one week, we just saw like a massive drop in TVL. We already knew like, I think we already felt it coming, but that was like confirmation that this was not going to come back anytime soon. We were already brainstorming new ideas at that point. We've been brainstorming new ideas since like the first year, I think. We always had this feeling that the product that we built, even though TBL was massive, like half a B, we were printing out like quite good cash flows. We had like a strong brand. I think we knew fundamentally we didn't have a strong moat for a lot of these sort of structured products, it's mostly like a sales and distribution game. A lot of banks basically have salespeople to sell it to their networks. And there's no like liquidity mode or any reason why any of these things get consolidated into a single winner long term. I think we knew that. And we knew we needed to sort of escape from this product to something else. Hopefully, like it could be adjacent. Hopefully, it could be some synergistic thing. So yeah, I think we're already brainstorming a bunch of stuff. And I think 
when the Luna collapse happened, we already had been building a few things. And I think we just went all in on building an exchange. We just felt like we don't want to build this seasonal yield product where people come when markets are risk on and, and people disappear when they're risk off. So, what was the competitive landscape look like on chain then? Yeah. So, we initially started out by building like an options exchange. I think yeah. we just felt like at that point in time, like realistically, even today, we feel like every options protocol sucks. I wouldn't want to trade on any of them. I think all of them at that point in time were these AMM centric products where, you know, if you're doing size, it was just impossible to trade on any of them because the curve would just give you an extremely bad price. So yeah, I think like no serious trader could actually do size on any of these like AMM protocols. And we thought the only way to do size was to trade against one of these 10 big institutional market makers. And they were not touching AMMs. Like they price Mm -hmm. options however they want they're not going to stick their money into this passive LP product. So yeah, we sort of worked backwards from there and thought like, okay, can we actually build a product where we can get all these institutional market makers on board? At that point in time, we knew everyone on the options side as well. So we had very good relationships with basically all the big options market makers. So are the big options market? These days, I would say like Galaxy, QCP, Genesis was pretty big. There's some smaller ones as well. There's some who are sort of more specialized on the auto book side of things. Some are more specialized on like client services and OTC. So it's kind of like segregated into those two categories. But yeah, we knew all of them and we spoke to them and we thought the hardest part with building a new exchange is bootstrapping liquidity and bootstrapping users. And like if there are no users, market makers are not going to care. So no, there's not going to be any liquidity. If there's no liquidity, users are not going to show up. Yeah. So that was like the hard cold start problem. And we felt like we had this pretty big vault product, which was basically like a very big whale, just selling a bunch of options every single week. And we thought, yeah, can we use this like product that we have to bootstrap this new exchange? Because we know we have at least one very big user, which sell sells. So that oh, was so the core you, idea. Uh, I didn't know that. You're dog coding your own product. Yeah. Yeah, a ribbon vaults was basically going to be like the whale of Avo, basically. Like Got it. Okay. We thought, yeah, we can funnel all this flow onto our exchange and like incentivize the market makers to start showing prices because they know there's going to be this big dumb seller every week who's just going to sell options. So yeah, I think that was the core idea. And yeah, so I just felt like options landscape in DeFi back then was terrible. Plus, we thought we had an edge in building a new exchange. So that's why we did it. If you look at the market today, there's maybe two other competitors. DYDX obviously is one that's been around for a while and they've kind of gone the same route as you have, right? Which is building out their own Cosmo Zone, AppChain, et cetera. And they were previously on StarkNet. And you will have, which I'm just starting to hear a lot about is Hyperliquid. Yep. I think they came out of nowhere. (laughs) Yeah. They're great. Maybe I could talk a bit about like our transition from options to perps and the landscape there. So we launched this options exchange in like April of last year. And yeah, I think pretty quickly we we became like the leader in the DeFi space because the DeFi space is just so small. I think in like Q3 and Q4, we were between 50 to 70% of like DeFi market share at that point in time. So for the options side. So I think we felt like do we want to just keep pushing the options thing, even though it, we have kind of tapped out the market already? Or should we like build an adjacent product? And yeah, I think we just felt like the option thing sort of required some timing. There may be a big market shift from perps to options, but it's not happening right now. But we know for sure, like we have the tech to build perps adjacent to our options as well. There's some like natural use cases between options and perps. So we just started building like a perps product as well. and. Yeah, just in Q4, we started growing it a lot. And that has become basically the like majority of our volume now is on the perp side. So it used to be like 20% of our volume was perps, but now it's like 90, 90, 95%. Um, so I think clearly like the current market cares more about, uh, perps for now. Um, yeah. if there's a shift to options, we're going to be there to capitalize. But for now, like people want to trade non BTC and ETH options like they want to trade solana they want to trade avax say injective all this stuff 
So, yeah, I think uh, we had to build what the market really cared about right now, uh, which is these like thematic coins. Uh, they want to play the rotation game as well. So, yeah, I think we started working on the perps and it's been pretty successful. On the perp side, yeah, we, we are still like a pretty small player on the perp side. But yeah, I think Hyperliquid, which was another exchange that launched maybe six months before us, they've been growing like crazy. It's a great product. I actually do think they're actually one of the best or maybe even the best on the perp side. So yeah, I always like a uh, scold my team. If like Hyperliquid is doing something better than us, I'm just like, why can't we be as good as them? So definitely use them as like the gold standard in terms of, yeah, just like product and liquidity. Julian, what do you think people prefer to trade perps than options? Yeah, I think honestly, the primary reason in the last six months, at least, I think there actually was a lot of options interest around like the ETF stuff. So the BTC options actually grew a lot, especially on like the CME side in the last like quarter. Everyone's sort of speculating on the BTC ETF and people actually trade options quite a bit. But I think for like the average trader, like you and me, I don't think we care about getting, I don't know, 30% 30% return on your call spread or something on BTC. I think what was just much more exciting, especially in Q4, was just like catching the three X's on say or injective. And there's no market to trade these options. If there are, they're going to be super wide. There's probably like one or two market makers in the world who want to make a market for these altcoins. And if the market's so wide, might as well just trade the pro. So I think that's been where the market is right now. It may change in the future, but we're kind of stuck in this place where no one wants to make the altcoin markets yet. Maybe it'll change in the future. Hyperliquid, you really like their product, but I can't find any information about their team. Are they anon? They're not. I think the founder is like an ex-prop trader. Yeah, so from what I've heard, like their team used to do just prop trading and they made a bunch of like money trading last cycle, I guess. So the current product's just like self-funded. They didn't do any like VC thing. So I think, yeah, I mean, they've been really successful in how far they've gotten without any external funding. So yeah, I think they actually have gotten a lot of like mindshare and interest from crypto Twitter as well. And they're on Cosmos, right? Yeah, so it's technically not Cosmos. I think oh, they are, yeah, they're like using the Tenement code base or something. Yeah. They're, it's not open source, so we don't actually know what the code base looks like. But um, yeah, some flavor of Tenement slash Cosmos. Char, do you have anything else you want to add to that before I move to a different topic? I'm just looking at the uh, ranking of top derivative projects. There's so many names that I either don't recognize or they just launched recently, like maybe in less than a year ago. It's wild. It's wild how many Perps projects there are. Yeah, I think that's like one. I mean, like the Perp market is probably one of the most competitive markets in DeFi right now. And I actually do think it's like competing over a fairly small pie right now. The set of users who trade on DEXs, perps, is still pretty limited to basically the same guys who are participating in DeFi last cycle. Maybe a few new users, but it's like nowhere reached the mainstream, like stealing market share from centralized exchanges. So I definitely do think it's like a extremely competitive market for where the market is. That's sort of why we've been also just like looking at other things adjacent to Perpdexes. I don't think, unless you are sort of the best, I think you would sort of be nowhere. So yeah, I think a lot of people are trying to gun for the top one or two spots, but I think everything in the middle is sort of just going to die. What other products are you looking at adjacent to Perps? Yeah, so I'm actually going to announce this like next week or in a few days, but I think one of the advantages that we have, especially over some of the other app chains like DYDX, Hyperliquid, those guys have built chains which only sort of facilitate trading. It's sort of by nature an app chain. You can't do anything else on the chain like by nature except trade. Those are the only type of transactions that the trade actually facilitates. But since we sort of forked like the OP stack, we actually can deploy a bunch of other stuff next to our exchange with pretty much like no effort. What do you mean by that? Are you talking like Osmosis? It could look somewhat like Osmosis, Uh. I think. Yeah, basically, we have just seen some of these layer twos get pretty big. Like, you know, Manta and Blast got a lot of attention. We think attracting a lot of capital, everyone's trying to build an ecosystem. So 
yeah, I think we are going along that route and that's going to be our major focus this year. We think some interesting things that no one has ever done before. Two things, actually. So first one, I think it's really interesting that all layer two projects don't actually own anything at the app layer. Maybe it's sort of for like decentralization sake, but Optimism doesn't actually own any apps on Optimism chain. Arbitrum doesn't own any apps on Arbitrum chain, but we, we have like this exchange, like a big app. And what if like, instead of having to monetize at the chain level, we just monetize at the app level, but we can sort of give back all sort of chain level surplus to users. So, you know, no sequence of fee or we just use our app to like subsidize the whole chain because our app actually makes money. These are some interesting ideas that we are thinking about. The second sort of interesting data point that we have is like the most difficult things for a layer two to be successful is Users don't want to bridge. Like the friction of bridging is yeah. just extremely high. I hate high. it. I hate it. Exactly. That's my, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not chasing any meme coins anymore on Ethereum. <laughs> <I'm done. laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like if someone tells you you need to bridge into this layer two, you're just not going to do it. It's over. But yeah. we have sort of made like the UX of depositing into Avo so seamless that these users don't even know that they're bridging onto our chain. So when Manta Network launched on Binance or whatever, like they had a hundred thousand users who have bridged into their chain. I think Blast is also in the range of a hundred to two hundred. But yeah, just like an interesting stat, like eighty thousand users have deposited into Avo already, which is like pretty close to where Blast is actually. And these eighty thousand wallets who have basically deposited into Avo haven't thought about it as like bridging into a chain that has nothing to do. They sort of thought about it as, oh, we're going to come here to use Avo to exchange. Yeah, I think we have gotten like quite a big user base just from that. And our idea now is like, can we actually take these users and send them to other apps on the chain as well? Does that make sense? I think that dramatically lowers like the friction of getting users in. If they're already here, they're already using one of the biggest apps on the chain itself. They already have something to do. If you give them sort of adjacent stuff to farm or to do other things on chain, I think they will do it. So yeah, these are some of our ideas of how we can bootstrap an ecosystem beyond just like a single app. And I think those are some of the advantages that we have over UIDX, for example. So that's something we are thinking about a lot now. That's a really interesting point, because if you think about it, centralized exchanges are essentially layer twos. They're centralized <laughs> layer twos. And when you deposit money into a centralized exchange, you don't think about bridging. You're just like yeah. in your head, it's the word, the verb is deposit, not bridging. <laughs> yeah. The moment you see the word bridge on the front end, it just raises You're not gonna your do it. level. It just makes it, it's really stressful. <laughs> so just changing that word. Yeah. <laughs> it makes the well, user security better. assumptions, right? Also, like you think about the security assumptions. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think like, and I know you guys are bullish on like base, but Coinbase does a very similar strategy. When you withdraw ETH on Coinbase, you can withdraw it to a bunch of networks and they will tell you like, oh, if you withdraw the base, it's, it's the cheapest route. And the reason for that is they subsidize that from the, all the revenues on their main product. So yeah, I think we have some ideas of like, can we just take all the revenues we make on this one exchange? Can we actually use that to basically give back to the users to try everything else around the exchange that actually is much more compelling for a user to use the ecosystem compared to like bridging into this ghost chain that has nothing on it so yeah i think those are some of the interesting ideas that we have and yeah i find it interesting that no other layer 2 project also owns the apps on it maybe kanto is actually an interesting example so kanto had like the lending protocol baked into like the protocol level so the note token Yep. So I think it might look something like that. Because Layer 1 also has incentives for apps that are being built on them, right? Yep. And so by enshrining lending, then they're capturing some of the volume and the users, and then they can use that as a way to bootstrap new apps that are coming on to the Kanto ecosystem. Yep. So okay. that was a very interesting idea. And yeah. Optimism and Arbitrum are never going to do that. So I think that's like a place that we are interested in playing. I think... One angle that we find very interesting as well is we don't want to be this chain where you deploy NFTs, you deploy all sorts of random stuff, social stuff. I think we have built our whole product around speculation. People come to able to trade perps, options, or 
speculate on these like pre-market launches. Can we just like double down on that and build other stuff which are in the same vein? So stuff like prediction markets, sports betting. I think the type of user who comes and trades at Jupiter pre-launch is also interested in doing a prediction market. I think we need to build something where the core culture of the chain is sort of very focused around one thing. And in our case, it's just like speculation. Like people actually bridge into able to use the Jupiter market. So I do think we want to build stuff in a similar vein as well. I feel like out of all the layer twos, Arbitrum is the only one that has an identity. Arbitrum yep. is a speculative chain. And the other ones yep. like OP and Base and they all have like a variety of different things. Arbitrum, like, so basically you want to have this very strong identity about your chain. Yeah, I think you just got to like double down on it. It even makes marketing easier. I think yeah. you just lose your user interest when you do everything and you do everything not very well. I think if you do a few things extremely well, people would know you for that and actually want to use it. We think it's just a stupid strategy to build like a general purpose chain where like everyone's welcome and you just have hackathons of all these different categories. I think that's like a dumb growth plan. But, you know, if we have some very specific ideas of stuff we can do, I think that makes a lot more sense. So that's sort of my focus this year. So what you mentioned earlier is, well, I'm curious, does optimism then have a moat, right? What you're saying is, Apps that are building on your rollup, as an example, they're building on it specifically to capture the users that are on that platform, that liquidity, and et cetera. And if that's the case, then I guess what I'm trying to get at is like, what is the moat that Optimism has versus you building your own identity and your own users? You're going the inverse, right? Like Optimism is being like, everyone just build on us. Right. What you're saying is build on us because we have users and liquidity. Yes, exactly. And we know like the type of users who came here are like basically pseudo gamblers. And if you're building some sort of gambling related app, like this is sort of the type of user you want. So yeah, I think we are super focused right now just on user acquisition and actually getting a lot of people using the product. And we think once you have that, you can build stuff around it. If you start out as this general purpose chain, I don't think it works. I mean, we have just seen that happen again and again for some of these like up and coming new chains like scroll and linear and stuff like that. Not to call them out specifically, but I think, yeah, it's just difficult to reason about why people would want to build there, even though they have some different tech. Ultimately, the user is sort of like, there are still no users there. So I think getting the people using it is still like the hard part of the equation. Yeah. So I think Solana has actually done fairly well on both like the builder side and the user side, which is like rare, I think. I really like her strategy. It's so different from everyone else's yeah. doing. Everyone else is pursuing the same strategy. <laughs> it's actually getting tiresome now. You have like 50 different rollups and like 10 different layer ones, all trying to airdrop some tokens to users to get boost the TBL up on a ghost chain. And then at the same time, Trying to reel in some third party developers, build some apps. Chow, are you having points fatigue? Because I'm kind of having points fatigue. I'm okay with points. Okay. You're in a shopping mall, right? And everyone's trying to give you free shit. How do you, as a user, figure out where you want to dedicate your time to shop? Do you know what I mean? There is a problem, a fundamental problem, which is like everyone is offering points. And yep. now users are inundated with all of these options. So, is it just, you know, whatever attracts the users? There's actually a really beautiful thing about points, I think, which is that okay. you know what you will get. And crypto DJs love that. They love the lottery aspect of it. That actually is strictly better than getting tokens. Well, I mean, it is tokens, right? <laughs> I do think, like, the pendulum is swinging the other way now against points. I think teams know that they can give you something at their, at their own arbitrary decision, and they can delay this decision for months, right? So the team ultimately has the ability to tell you what you get. And I think a lot of teams are deciding to give you as little as possible. So you are getting farmed by the team instead of uh, you farming the project. So yeah, I do think the more projects that basically take all this interest through points and basically give back the users like nothing or close to nothing, that is happening now. And <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's that. going to make, that's what's going to make people hate points. I think it's yeah. just like, if the culture has just sort of swung in the other direction and you're getting like 
what is supposed to be like this interesting meta game that people want to play and speculate on is becoming just like a very bad game to play when the team decides to just like give you nothing. So I kind of feel feel that vibe shift in the last like few weeks. So I don't think we're going to do a point system. <laughs> But Julian, speaking of that, like if you look at like Manta and Blast, both of them have over a billion dollars in TVL without any like real apps, and yep. people just go there for the potential airdrops and the yield. By the way, airdrops is a form of randomized yield, and right, love of course. And the strategy works. But how do you think about that? Are you gonna? Do, are you thinking of doing another token to incentivize this behavior, or I don't think. It's a repeatable strategy. I think the early movers who create the meta would basically get the most out of it. But the tenth、yeah. project who's going to launch like the tenth layer two, which has points, no one's going to care. So I do think like someone needs to change the meta first and create something interesting, and that's going to get all the traction. So maybe in this case, Blast invented the meta. Manta copied it once. Maybe like the third one is not going to work so well. I don't know how. Either we have to reinvent a new type of user acquisition game, or find something else. Actually, one kind of interesting alpha that we've been looking at is like we we've been doing a lot of like marketing, and we've been doing a lot of like normie marketing, and it's been working like shockingly well. What's normie marketing? Like YouTube or TikTok? Yeah, a very recent one, like just like two or three days ago, is we worked with this like influencer to make like a TikTok about Evo, and it got like a hundred K views. So it's like extremely impressive ROI, and all those are like really different set of users from like the crypto Twitter world. It's just like a TikTok crypto influencer. I'm looking it up now. <laughs> it's surprisingly not easy to find, but yeah, I think it's really like overlooked by a lot of teams. I think crypto Twitter is extremely competitive in terms of like attention, but it's easier to play like the attention game outside of crypto Twitter. So we've been just like. Trying to double down on that, a lot of like non-English content has worked actually pretty well. Russians, Russians and Chinese, a lot of DJ, Russian yeah. Chinese DJs. Exactly. So yeah, I think like interestingly, if you look at Evo, the only two languages that are supported, which are not English, is Russian and Chinese. <laughs> so we just looked at like the demographics; it naturally skewed to those regions.、Yeah. Russia slash Ukraine slash like a.、Uh, Russian-speaking zones and like Chinese, so we just double down on that. We're doing a lot more Chinese content, working with a lot of like Russian-speaking folks as well, like KOL networks. So I, I think it's like a very interesting place to play instead of just like paying the same Twitter influencers to tweet some thread about Evo on like English CT. That's something we've been actually trying to focus on, and I think that's like a way more robust like. Audience and user set than the people who are just jumping from points to points. So yeah, we, we've just been like really focused on that now. YouTube is also really interesting. I, I feel like there is a very distinct culture on YouTube versus CT. Like for example, CT really despises Cardano and XRP. But if、yeah. you go on YouTube, there's so many people shilling Cardano and XRP. And yeah, no, like、uh, I've been like super deep in the crypto YouTube rabbit holes. We actually got like an intern in our team who basically his job is to watch all these YouTube channels, just like、oh、compile, like get a transcript of every video, put it into like AI, just like uh summarize all the videos, get all the ticker symbols, and put it in like a spreadsheet. So we, we can literally have like a view of like across all these different channels, what are people talking about right now? Everyone's like talking about ETF, and then everyone's talking about X. I don't think it's actually. Something you can use to trade because it's usually like a delayed indicator. It's like a lagging thing, not a a leading indicator. But you know, it's it's extremely interesting just to see like the sentiment and the picks that people are talking about. But yeah, I mean, I think someone should like build an an automated AI to, to sort of get all this information instead of just getting some intern to just like click and write transcribe everything. I find that very interesting, and it's like sort of maybe it's a、uh, It's an area that most people are just like not looking in right now, especially our competitors. I think the YouTube thumbnails are so cringe. <laughs> they work、yeah. really well, but they work really well. I mean,、yeah. <laughs> we tried it within Good Game for a bit. One of the keywords that you guys needed to use is like, you know how you guys. 
call thing coins or tokens. All of them call it cryptos. Top 10 cryptos to watch for the new bull run. That's sort of like the keyword oh. when I know it's like a normie, <laughs> normie targeted audience. Good to they, know. They don't, they don't say tokens at all. They just call it cryptos. Interesting. One more point I want to ask you before we go to uh, founder lessons. There's this market called Wales OTC. Yep. And you could think of this as a kind of a pre-market trading as well. And what people do is they deposit some collateral for the points that they have, and people are able to buy and sell points. So recently, and I've been following Wales OTC for some time, I think they have like $18 million in volume done now, which is pretty impressive. People are buying juke points. And I've seen friend tech token points also trade. And I'm seeing many, many popular point systems trade. So I guess, how do you see this market? And is this kind of competitive to your pre, I mean, perps product as well? Yeah, I think it's definitely a clear extension of the pre-launch markets. Like pre-launch markets are already taking the idea of building something that people want to speculate on to the next level. It's like, yeah. you're not just trading the token, you're trading the token before the token launches. And you're like playing this game of what the price is going to be. And points are sort of like the next level. It's like, we don't even know if these things are going to translate to tokens, but we're going to make a market for it. So it's great. It's very interesting. I wish we did it first. I think, yeah, they're doing really well. And right now there is a lot of interest in just trading these things. I think one of the issues for us or what we have seen is like our pre-launch stuff drives a lot of attention and users, but in terms of like actual revenue, it's extremely small part of the whole business. It's a go-to-market strategy, right? Exactly. So it is like user acquisition, but like the volume numbers are just not big enough to justify like a big business. So I haven't done the math, but I'm if I were to guess, I think our pre-launch revenues are less than 2 or 3% of the total exchange revenues. Most of the revenue still comes from people trading majors and sort of the coin of the month. So yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's a great idea, but I'm just not sure if it can be a big standalone project. So I'm happy that we worked on like the pre-launch stuff as a user acquisition. I just don't know if it's big enough to be a standalone like company. Got it. Now, Julian, you know, a part of our user base is primarily founders that are building in the space. I know you spoke to our cohorts in the past many times to kind of give them feedback on your journey as a founder. If you had to distill some of the lessons that you've learned, what are some key lessons that you've learned as a founder in crypto, building crypto? I mean, there's many, but yeah, just high level and then we'll kind of go deeper. I think, yeah, one of the obvious ones is just like, obviously uh, you just got to persevere through the market cycles. So yeah, one interesting thing is like, I think in Q3 or Q4 of like last year, there was one week where our metrics just started doubling and it didn't stop. It was kind of flat for two quarters and then it started doubling and tripling. So if you are sort of like, if you like gave up one month before that or one week before that, you would have missed like the sudden change in market environment. I think it's, you sort of just got to stick it out for, I think if you are like a long-term believer in the space, I mean, if you actually believe in crypto long-term, things will probably come back. So yeah, just being able to stick it out till then is super important. I couldn't tell you when the market would have come back, but it just did randomly and everything just started looking better. So it's hard. I mean, there's so many like NFT exchanges that gave up in the first cycle, right? Like the 2017 cycle. Yep. Like OpenSea sort of just stuck it out and one day they became like a $10 billion company. So it's like a mental... It's more about being resilient to the market conditions, your emotions, and the environment around you and focusing on the, the long-term goal. Yeah, so I think that's right. The hard part about that is I don't think you can just sit around and wait for the market to come back. You still need to still try and find something interesting. So even when the markets were like super quiet, we were still just trying to figure out like, yeah, what is the meta now? Even if we don't have 100,000 users, can we find 100 people, build something interesting for them? I do think you got to constantly be chasing market feedback instead of just like praying that this vision is going to become something one day. So I think if your vision's correct, there'll be a small set of users who actually believe in it already. So you just got to like find all of them. I'm sure you guys like know this from like the tensor days, right? Like uh, Solana NFTs were like in sort of max depression zone. Oh my but God. There, were, there yeah. were a few people still interested in it. 
and yeah. yeah just building something for them is really important instead of just like chilling and waiting for like the nfts to come back if they were ever going to so yeah i think those are like two two things you gotta balance and they're like somewhat contradictory julian you know what i found like by talking to even some of the best founders in the space i think at some point they almost all thought of pivoting away from crypto but they still <laughs> ended up staying crypto because there's no other industry in which they have like an unfair advantage. So like they just stuck with crypto and two, they just took a leap of faith. Has this thought ever crossed your mind? It hasn't really crossed my mind. I think there's never been a point where I thought that the crypto is going to disappear as an industry. I think, you know, I mean, the pivot that we made kind of was like one section to a, diff- a bigger market or like a more interesting market. So for sure we can make those pivots, but no, I, I was pretty convicted i don't think i ever thought it's going to disappear yeah maybe an interesting sort of like side quest that i did was like i took a week off to like learn ai stuff like two years ago and coincidentally that was the week that ftx collapsed (laughs) so my week of like rest and self-learning was like completely disrupted by the whole ftx situation i was interested in some other stuff and just like learn about it on the side but i don't think we ever thought about like pivoting completely i just have such a strong aversion to i don't want to be the type of person who pivots to ai at the crypto bottom and there's so many of those so, so many <laughs> so <laughs> many yeah. rest in peace i'm like very aware that that's like a common phenomenon so i've been in crypto for what almost eight years or something long time now yeah i met like child so many years ago when i was still in like university so i think i do obviously care about like the core beliefs of the space i love btc as an like an idea so yeah i think some of those like core principles keeps me in the space instead of just like pivoting to the next hot thing all the ogs that i know always pay respect to bitcoin of oh, course yeah. <laughs> cool well chow any final thoughts notes questions no i'm good julian no i mean thank you for having me on i think uh I've been doing a lot of like, I am on like a little media tour now. So I appreciate like the platform. And uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully your audience isn't bored by my trading stories. We love the trading stories. Those are the best. (laughs) I mean, obviously, Abo is a great product, but we love to uh, talk about your coins. Couple tweets that I just saw. One is Standard Chartered Bank thinks that ETF is going to get approved in May and uh, Ethereum just pumped. Ken Griffin from Citadel thinks that we're going to have a soft landing and the Fed's going to cut rates. And so markets are looking very green, which is all great for Abel, is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, it's great. I managed to get some uh, Solana at like $80. So I'm happy about that trade like in the last week or so. On leverage or no? No, I just spot. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, exciting times, exciting next six months a year. Julian. Always good seeing you. Thanks for your time and uh, we'll catch you soon. Cool. Thanks, guys. That was a great convo. Um, I've learned a lot specifically around, I mean, I thought it was much more challenging for founders to build on app rollups and DA layers and all this stuff, but it may not be as difficult as I thought it would be. Yeah. I mean, Conduit and Caldera have done a pretty good job of making this easy. But you know what really strikes me the most? is that by using Celestia as a separate DA layer versus Ethereum as the main DA, they're able to save nearly 100% of their cost. It's insane. $200,000 a month. Yeah. That's a lot of money saved. Yeah. So I may, like in our last pod, I had said that the narrative probably way too further along than where the tech is. Yeah. And maybe that's just because Celestia hasn't really turned on the monetization engine yet, right? And uh, maybe... It's rightfully where it's at. I'm not sure. I'm not saying they don't need to turn on the monetization. They just need to get a bunch of rollups to deploy on Celestia, and then the narrative will get going, and then the token will pump. <laughs> it already has pumped. That's just sir. how crypto works. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm shocked by the uh, savings of using Celestia. Again, yeah. like we said this, but 4844, which is going to launch in March or April, will not come anywhere close to using Celestia as a DA. The only reason why someone would use 484 based on what Julian said is to for security reasons, right? Like, yeah. And maybe that it could be a good redundancy, right? Which yeah, is, exactly. So that's what he said. So he uses Celestia as the primary DA, but then yeah. if Celestia goes down, they can switch the DA in real time back to Ethereum. Then by all means, 
protodyne sharding is great for people that are very aligned with Ethereum, but I would expect the cost savings, they'll see the cost savings, say like, we're just going to use Celestia. Yep. And then we'll use Ethereum protodyne sharding as a backup or eigenlayer and protodyne sharding. Yeah, it's wild. It's wild how how much difference there is. The full dang sharding, so the proto dang sharding is this year in a couple of months, but the full dang sharding, there's it's not in plain sight. The full dang sharding is supposedly another year. I don't know how long it's going to take, but supposedly close to being as good as uh, Celestia. I love to see some competition in this space. I want to see Ethereum compete for stuff that's being abstracted away from Ethereum. Yeah, we need to see the was it the Chad Vitalik, <laughs> <laughs> the Fit Vitalik, the Fit Vitalik. Yeah, we need to see him back on. Yeah, funny enough, he put a tweet out. Uh, <laughs> what was it today? Where he said, "Meme coin holders be like meow meow meow." <laughs> <laughs> And then he bottom ticked, sold a part of his Harry Potter Obama Sonic 10 Inu. I guess someone sent him a bunch. Yeah. And he bottom ticked it to the T. Like he sold like $40 where he still has a bunch left. And all of the Harry Potter Obama Sonic 10 Inu holders saw that as very bullish, similar to like how Vitalik tweeted about Solana as Solana was hitting $8. Yeah. And so now Obama Harry Potter is pumping. <laughs> 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 Ethereum needs a meme coin. They need something to rally around. And I think this is good. Like it gives people to come back, like get that speculative power ball of money to come back to Ethereum. So it's good to see that. It's just a side note. The other meme coin that Julian talked about is Tau. <laughs> for, for me, it's a meme coin. What a meme coin. It's the best meme. It's uh, yeah. AI X crypto. And I've seen so many people bullish on it, but no one is able to explain why they're bullish. Yeah. It's a cult. It's a cult. They were early. They made it very hard to use a product, which is, what's the alpha? The harder the product to use, the more money you can make. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like when I tried using ordinals, it's such a, sh my God, it was hard and you have to be patient. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, maybe we'll see where it goes. You know what's interesting? Julian is Actually, very bullish Solana, long-term bullish Solana. He has a yeah. bag of Solana, and yet he's staying on Ethereum. And he made it very clear, which is that it's much better to be aligned with one tribe than to have no tribe at all. That's the primary reason why he's not migrating to Solana, despite himself being bullish Solana. And we've seen this multiple times in the past, where a protocol or an app switching the chain from Solana to Ethereum, or vice versa, end up failing on the new chain. Seems like a consensus idea now. Like Founders are fully aware of this, and they want to be aligned with a particular tribe. It makes sense, if you think about it. Oh, there was a funny tweet you shared with us internally. Um, <laughs> you know, like I don't know how I feel about it, but I'll, I'll just bring it up anyways. But, you know, Bitcoin is like Judaism. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Christianity is like Ethereum and Solana is like Islam, which like, I don't know anything about it. I don't agree with it. I'm just bringing it up, mm -hmm. which is these communities are, it's very religion based, right? I mean, you're invested in these communities for the long run. You're a bag holder. You have to protect the bags and you do so by creating this tribalistic community of bag holders that continue to protect the narrative so they become successful. The top layer ones are all religions, right? They're all religions. Imagine 2,000 years ago, if you could long Christianity. Yeah. Would you have done it? Of course. Yeah. Of course you would long Christianity 2,000 years ago if it had a token. And the same idea applies here. I mean, if Christianity had a token, I mean, Christianity and Islam both had a token, it would be the top two most valuable <laughs> tokens in the world by, by FDV, period. period. It would be more valuable than gold. By the way, yeah. gold is the asset with the highest... MCAP, market cap, is the yeah. one asset that has the highest market cap. But I think if Christianity and Islam had tokens, they would be number one and two. I would long both. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, the founders that are listening, if you're building, <laughs> uh, if you're building uh, front tech like products, meme coin like products, hit us up. We're always looking for startups that are doing that. And in fact, actually, we're looking for products that are being built around the Islamic finance ecosystem too. 
Mm, yes. A mega bullish Islamic finance. What else did we learn? Comparison between centralized perps versus decentralized on-chain perps, mm -hmm. where he wants to abstract away all of the experiences that traders go through to use on-chain mm -hmm. perps. No more quote-unquote bridging, even though under yes. the hood is bridging. Replace the word bridging with deposit. That would remove the distress level of traders. Yeah. I know that feeling myself. Yeah, it's just the fees, the, all this stuff, just the security, like you worry about security. Yeah. And uh, yeah, deposit just, is just a great framing for how you should build your product, uh, if it's an app rollup or, or et cetera. He has a very contrarian strategy for user acquisition and growing the layer two. Ah, yes. Because... Every single other layer two and layer one, they use the same playbook, which is getting listed on exchanges, points, on the token, points, airdrop, getting the users, paradigm. new paradigm, Manta and Blast, use the airdrop to attract users onto the chain, grow the TVL, which in turn attracts developers to build third party apps, which is a sound strategy, but it is. everyone does that. And Julian's strategy is the total opposite, which is to enshrine their own first party apps as opposed to depending on third party. Yeah. So this is like similar to the osmosis strategy, right? Or the Kanto strategy, which is try to build more stuff within the layer one or roll up so that they don't ever have to leave. Because the goal really is to keep the liquidity there. Like don't let the liquidity leave. Mm -hmm. And that'll act as a forcing function to make, to increase the TVL users and it gets stickier mm -hmm. and the interesting point there is if the layer two owns the apps first party apps rather than third party apps then you can use the apps to monetize yes rather than using the chain to monetize so the users don't need to pay any on-chain transaction fees anymore yeah to the sequencer itself but rather pay fees to the app so we talk about moats for layer twos right and to me like after i got off the call i felt as if layer twos may not really have a moat. They do now, right? Obviously, infrastructure that they provide, you know, sequencing. But if you build an app rollup, let's say in Julian's, let's just say in Julian's case, he has the best perps on there. He has the best decks on there, whatever, right? And then founders go and look like, okay, well, I'll just build here because, you know, there's this incredible vibrant ecosystem. Is there the inverse that could happen from this? Like where App rollups could cannibalize layer twos, like layer two, like our generic layer twos. Generic layer twos, exactly. Yeah, of course. I mean, ultimately, if you have a bunch of app specific rollups, then again, the layer twos just become test nets for the new products. Who owns what in terms of moat here? Like we talked about this last podcast, which is base could easily spin out and they could create their own OP stack, right? Mm -hmm. Where they don't have to use OP, they can just fork OP, build out their own stack and allow people to build on it. But then mm -hmm. those app rollups, if they get big enough, they could do the same thing. So who owns what? What's the actual moat here? The brand is a moat. To start with, but then once you build your own brand, then what? But the tech stack is also a moat. Like when Bayes uses OP stack and they have a bunch of developers such as Brandtech building on top of Bayes, yep. which is basically built on top of OP stack, Bayes cannot easily switch to another tech stack. Because if they do, they lose the developers. The, the tech stack is not compatible with each other. Well, I guess I get where you're getting at. Okay. So they can just, that stack is harder. Well, yeah, because if you were to fork OP, convince developers to build on that, I mean, but that's just a completely new chain that you have to convince developers to build on, right? Yeah. Yeah. But to your point, the fact that OP is open source. Yeah. I mean, OP can monetize in some other way by selling the OP stack. I don't know how much Once, revenue that... Yeah, I think sequencing makes sense from a, as a source of revenue, right? For them. Sequencing, I don't know. Like, it's still unclear for me how... I get the framing of, like, the tech stack is kind of what drives some sort of alignment to OP, but, like, there's still no value accrual, right? Yeah. I'm not sure. It's still uh, very unclear for me. You know, after so many years in crypto, I just stopped thinking about moat. Yeah, because... I mean, there's no moat. Who gives a shit? <laughs> There's that, but also the fact that the space moves so fast, you cannot think much more beyond one cycle. You can't be right curve here. It's futile to, to think <laughs> that far into the future. Yeah. I just think at most one in terms of one cycle. 
But within that cycle, within the time horizon of one cycle, I don't think mode matters that much. At the end of the day, within it's one just cycle, it's attention, it's narrative, it's well, it's the treasury mindset. too, right? It's the treasury. It's the people. It's the ah, I think I know what it is. It's the religion. <laughs> That's the moat. Yeah, it's the religion. Interesting. This was a a good revelation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have been now baptized. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is fun. We're going to have some special speakers coming around the next few uh, weeks. A fun one is with uh, Ansem Zion. Mm. He, uh, we're actually going to be meeting him up in real life and recording a, a podcast with him. New nice. Place. So that'll be fun. All right. So if you have any questions for him, hit us up. Otherwise, we'll catch you next time. Next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Good Game. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next week.